The topic of this conference um, really goes, uh, struck me immediately when Clay contacted me about this because this has really been core to my entire career. Uh, frankly, misperception in U.S.-China relations was probably the reason why I decided to get a Ph.D. Um, and when I was offered a, a position to uh, create and direct an institute for U.S.-China issues at the University of Oklahoma, um, one of the big draws was the fact that I would have a budget that I could use to, to help create uh, this political psychology of U.S.-China relations research program, uh, which I run at the Institute. Um, so I want to come out of the closet for those of you who know me only from my first book, uh, China's New Nationalism, which was based primarily on qualitative research. I've spent uh, a number of years retooling, and uh, now I'm a political psychologist, which in practice means I, I do applied social psychology. Psychology, so why, does that, why is that a different kind of approach? Um, basically, the, the, I guess Clay said um, perception matters. Uh, I guess you could go even farther and say perception is reality. Uh, this is kind of the bottom line for most uh, social psychologists. And the argument basically is that the objective world doesn't speak for itself, that um, simply learning a foreign language, uh, for example, as an American to be able to speak Chinese or as a Chinese to be able to speak English, and even being, to a certain extent, culturally fluent, which is kind of the hot thing in linguistics uh, these days, uh, may not always be enough, because the world that we actively construct may actually be quite different. So communication is not unproblematic. Um, and what I want to do today is share with you uh, a little bit of the research that's come out of my lab that uh, addresses uh, this issue. Um, I want to start from the basic uh, premise of a lack of much mutual knowledge. We don't seem to know all that much about each other, and we understand uh, even less. And I think that distinction came out this morning, especially in Tom's discussion of the Diaoyu Islands. Um, but basically, the, the inability to understand the other side's perspective is, is what distinguishes knowledge and understanding. Just to give a little factual basis for this, um, I'm going to be presenting some research coming out of my new book on American foreign policy. It included a five-item uh, multiple-choice quiz on knowledge about China, and this was given to a, a nationally representative U.S. sample in the spring of 2011, and here are the five questions. Um, just to read the last one, you know, only 41 percent of Americans could correctly identify the name of the party that governs China today. Um, now you have to assess the difficulty of these questions to judge whether an average score of 43 is good or not. Um, I don't think the questions are that tough, so I think it does uh, provide some support for the idea that Americans on average are not that knowledgeable about China. But I would argue that the same is largely true uh, for Chinese about America, that they're not that knowledgeable either. Um, I don't have nationally representative data, but I have a, a very large 2011 internet convenience sample uh, with, that included 10 multiple choice questions and also yielded a very poor score of just 56. Um, given that in these kinds of multiple choice uh, questions with just four response options, 25 would be a, uh, you know, chance would result in a 25. Just to give you a feel for the kinds of items, you know, 64% uh, could identify July 4th, 67% uh, could um, recognize that uh, the U.S. president has a four-year term, um, only 73% could identify the first American president as George Washington. Um, so it doesn't seem like we're very knowledgeable about each other. And yet, what's remarkable is that Americans and Chinese um, have remarkably consistent attitudes towards one another. And this holds true at both the individual and aggregate level. And so what I mean by this is if, for example, if we compare surveys across time that we've done of one another, there's remarkable consistency um, at the aggregate level. And then at the individual level, if you look at the correlations among responses to surveys at any individual level, you'll see that there's a lot of consistency there as well. 
So how do we explain that? In the absence of knowledge, we have consistent attitudes towards one another. Well, what we've been hearing, what we heard all morning is the standard political science and communication study approach, which is basically that um, Chinese and Americans, like all peoples, are empty vessels. They're not knowledgeable. So how do they have their attitudes? How do they form their international attitudes? Um, they do so through the media. So it's basically a top-down process. Elites and the media tell us what to think about one another. And clearly, that is a part of uh, the story, right? The adver advertisements that Clay showed us at the beginning uh, in the morning, um, that plays an important role, these kinds of top-down information flows. But coming from a psych perspective, what I would like to do is argue that that's not the whole story, that another big part of the story is that all Americans and Chinese have pre-existing ideological predispositions that help us fill in the gaps uh, in terms of uh, knowledge that we don't have and allow us to form coherent images of one another. Part of this process is the very simple idea of heuristics, that when we ask someone a question, if you're asked a question that is difficult, what do we do? We have a mental shortcut. We think of a simpler question. So if you ask me, you know, do, do I want a tougher or friendlier policy towards China, I don't really know, and so I'm going to ask myself, well, how do I feel about Chinese people? Or how do I feel about the Chinese government? And then I say, well, I don't really know. <laughs> but I have these ideological predispositions. You know, maybe I'm a libertarian, and I don't really like the American government. Well, I'm not going to probably like the communist Chinese government either. That's an ideological predisposition. Or say you're someone who went through or was part of the civil rights movement and feel strongly about racial equality. If you think about, well, how do I feel about the Chinese people? I feel great about the Chinese people. And so that contributes to desires for a friendlier policy towards China. So specifically what I want to argue today is that this takes two manifestations. In the American context, the ideology that matters most is our shared liberalism. And the big L liberalism is the idea of individual freedom. And this, is, this powerfully shapes American views of red China. On the Chinese side, it's a different ideology that matters more. It's not liberalism. <laughs> it's nationalism. It's the subject of my first book. And I argue that nationalism molds Chinese views of America, the beautiful imperialist, Mei Di. <laughs> so essentially, these, these are the topics of, of uh, these two books, the nationalism book. Um, and the, the forthcoming Stanford University Press book on the politics of American foreign policy. Both of these explore these two different kinds of ideology, uh, nationalism in the Chinese case and uh, liberalism in the American case, and how they contribute to perception and misperception in bilateral relations. So to give you a taste from uh, the book that's coming out, uh, so this is looking at a 2011 survey, uh, national survey of Americans, and, th and uh, this, these are mean scores for the full sample um, of feelings towards foreign countries and international organizations. And I'm going to highlight here China. So the only countries that Americans felt cooler towards were you know, virtual enemies in North Korea and Iran. So pretty cool both in absolute terms, 34 degrees, um, but also in relative terms. So how do we explain this? Uh, basically, the book is an attempt to explain, well, actually, not, not this one, but how do we explain the China one? What I want to do is make a pitch for you about the broad, overarching framework of liberalism that structures the way Americans look at China. And this image from the Tiananmen Square massacre I use when I teach uh, undergraduates uh, because I think it powerfully um, symbolizes the, the reductionism at the heart of American uh, understandings of Chinese politics, that basically Chinese politics can be reduced to brute force. We identify with this individual as a courageous champion of individual liberty, and the tanks represent the evil CCP. And is this some kind of fanhua, some kind of anti-China conspiracy? Absolutely not. This is at the core of how Americans view almost everything. The liberal fear of the state has a long history and is not unique to our attitudes towards China. Uh, this is a George Orwell's big brother. 
Uh, but liberals also fear society. Uh, this is just one more example, the Lord of the Flies. But um, de Tocqueville talked about the tyranny of the masses. And of course, we even fear the machine, anything that could take away our individual liberty. Uh, here in Hollywood, here close to Hollywood, you'll, they've taken tremendous advantage and made billions of dollars, I'm sure, profiting from the liberal fear of our loss of freedom. And if it takes a machine to do that, we'll make our millions that way. Um, so the broad argument I want to make is that our shared liberalism helps structure very broad uh, American, at the aggregate level, views of the world. If you look at this sequence of countries um, in the survey data, you'll see that the, the, freak, the countries that we feel warmest towards after ourself, England, Japan, Israel, Germany, those are the free countries. The countries we don't like are the ones we see as unfree, North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, China, Russia. But of course, we all know that within our shared liberalism, there's differences among Americans. We are a divided country between liberals, small l liberals and conservatives. We all know this. And what this chart does, and this is really the takeoff point for the new book, is showing that there is a consistent ideological gap in the feelings and policy preferences. This is just the feelings. Feelings that Americans have towards uh, foreign countries and international organizations. America, uh, the China case is actually extremely typical. Liberals feel warmer towards China and most other countries than conservatives do. And, there, and the, the book explores the reasons for that. Now this is a complicated um, multiple mediation model and I work really hard in the book to try to help everyone make sense of this. Um, I don't want you to get uh, sort of caught up in it, but if you look at the, does this work? Yeah. Good. Well, there we go. So I was just talking uh, earlier about you ask someone, do you want a friendlier or tougher China policy? Um, the, the affect heuristic that may come to mind is, well, how do I feel about the Chinese people? That's the doesn't seem to be coming up. That's the one on the top right there, prejudice towards Chinese people. Or they may think, well, how do I feel about the Chinese government? And that's the box on the bottom. And what this model shows is that part of the difference between one of the reasons why conservatives tend to feel cool, uh, want tougher China policy than liberals is old-fashioned prejudice. Um, there is a little bit of that remaining, and it has a long history, obviously, uh, in America of anti-Asian prejudice, and it does contribute to that overall liberal conservative difference. But the much larger reason for it, and that's the path at the bottom here with the thicker arrows, um, has nothing to do with race and has everything to do with the fact that the China, China is governed by a communist party. And so it's that big difference between liberals and conservatives in their feelings about communism that is a larger driver of overall liberal conservative differences in attitudes towards China. So that's the bottom path. And I just put some images together to sort of capture um, how Americans feel about communism and how often it's a very partisan issue. Anti-communism has always been more prevalent on the American right than on the American left. I mean, this is a pretty straightforward point. And what, this, what designing a careful survey and implementing it and analyzing it shows is that you can sort of break that down into different reasons. So I measured not just liberal and conservative identification, but also dimensions of ideology. And I measure four dimensions of American ideology, cultural, socio-racial, economic, and political. Um, the first here is uh, cultural. So you know, why would conservatives uh, feel cooler towards communist countries? Well, if they're Christian right conservatives, they may not like atheism. But you know, say they're business conservatives, they may not like the idea of socialist economic redistribution. Or say they're a libertarian. What they may not like about China, it has nothing to do with the Chinese people. It just has to do with the fact that the Communist Party is an overwhelmingly strong state. So there are different reasons why different kinds of liberals and conservatives all line up on the same side against one another, contributing to this overall difference. That's what a mediation model does. Um, 
Okay, so now let's flip over to the other side, thinking about ideology in terms of China, uh, the way Chinese view the United States. And here I'm going to be echoing a lot of what has been discussed already, and this comes from primarily from my first book, uh, China's New Nationalism. Um, but basically what I want to argue is that Chinese nationalist narratives, the stories they tell about the century of humiliation, the Bainian Guoqiu, um, have a, a very fundamental uh, impact in shaping Chinese attitudes towards America. And you see this in street demonstrations, in protests. This is from the Belgrade uh, bombing episode in 1999, uh, where three journalists slash intelligence analysts um, were killed um, in the uh, embassy in Serbia. Um, I mean, the bombs didn't miss their intended target. It was the location where all the radio transmissions and, and intelligence activity was occurring. Um, there was a lot of, tr of anger by, by Chinese people that the embassy's sovereignty had been violated, that Chinese had been killed. Um, and the same thing occurred two years later with the April 2001 spy plane collision um, that led to the American plane landing in Hainan Island. Um, the anger that was expressed, I want to argue, has similar kinds of roots in ideological predispositions, and specifically on nationalism, which has been at the heart of Chinese Communist Party claims to legitimacy from the very beginning. What is Mao famous for saying when the PRC was established in 1949? We would think it should be, an American might say, oh, it must have been Workers of the World Unite. Must have been a Marxist slogan. No. That's not what he's, whoops, that's not what he's remembered for. He's remembered for saying China has stood up. Now, of course, nobody could understand his accent. So we don't really know what happened. But the point is, what the story that is told is that he, has, he said China has stood up. And to me, that's what matters. The, the story that Chinese live by, literally, is one of China throwing off Western and Japanese imperialist exploitation and standing up and being independent and proud. And this nationalist narrative, um, probably most of you are familiar with this, but it really starts with the first opium war uh, where the Chinese lose to the British and they're forced to sign the humiliating Treaty of Nanjing. Uh, but then there's a whole series of events, of events over the next century or so that are part of this narrative. Westerners, by their nature, are imperialist, aggressive bullies. You know, it's, it's very, very fundamental way of viewing the world, and America is not exempt from that, just like liberalism structures the ways that Americans look at, at China. Um, a little bit of a, a detailed twist is that uh, this narrative has undergone change um, in the post-Mao period, and that change, I think, is central for understanding the timing of the emergence of popular Chinese nationalism, which is to say that in the Maoist period, anger about victimization was largely suppressed in favor of a victor narrative of Chinese heroism in resisting and overcoming uh, Western and Japanese imperialism. Um, and that strain lives on today. There are still this narrative of, of victory and defeating the United States, for example, on the Korean War, same event, same participants, Americans and Chinese, completely different understanding of what happened. For the Chinese, it's extremely clear. China won, America lost, right? So same perception is reality. The victor narrative lives on, uh, but there's a new victimization narrative about national humiliation that, forced, that led Chinese, you know, 50 years after the fact to re-engage, um, to, to sort of directly uh, address the suffering that, that the Chinese people experienced, which is objective, um, but the fact is that they had, were only then, only more recently, uh, directly confronting that. And this is clearly seen in discourse, so you don't have to, to look very hard to see how events of today are tied in with this nationalist narrative. So this is how ideology fills in the pieces. When you don't know something, you connect it to things that you know. And that's what's going to happen in U.S.-China relations. So this is a, an editorial in which it was uh, very clear that the Belgrade bombing was, was linked in um, with the, the century of humiliation. 
And this, I don't want to try to explain this, and I don't have time to, um, but this is just to show that we can do the same kind of quantitative analysis using survey research or experimental research with Chinese uh, subjects uh, that we can do with Americans. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm out of time, um, so I'll have to leave it there. Thank you.